Now, for the last half century, free enterprise and what it, is, what it implies has been under unrelenting attack in our country. Americans from all walks of life, whether they realize or not, have demonstrated a deep and abiding contempt for private property rights and economic freedom. Free enterprise in our country is threatened today not because of its failure, but somewhat ironically, because of its success. <clears throat> that is, capitalism, or free enterprise, has been so successful in eliminating the traditional problems of mankind, such as disease, pestilence, hunger, and gross poverty, that all other human problems appear to us to be at once inexcusable and unbearable. The desire by many Americans to eliminate these so-called inexcusable and unbearable problems has led us away from the basic ideals and principles upon which our nation was built. In the name of other ideals, such as equality of income, sex and race balance, affordable housing, medical care, orderly markets, consumer protection, energy conservation, we go on and on, we have abandoned many personal freedoms. As a result of widespread control by government in an effort to achieve these so-called higher objectives, we're increasingly being subordinated to the point where considerations of personal liberty are, are either secondary or tertiary matters. What I'm saying, basic personal liberty is treated with contempt by our government. Now, you say, well, aren't you exaggerating a little bit, Williams? Well, imagine I write a letter to the United States Congress. And I tell them, my name is Walter Williams. I am an emancipated adult. I am fully capable of taking care of my retirement needs. And if I fail to do so, let me starve or beg, but stop taking money out of my paycheck for Social Security. How do you think I'd be greeted? <laughs> It'd be greeted with contempt. That is, here are some people telling you and me how much we should set, set aside out of each, pay, uh, each, uh, each week's paycheck for retirement. How would you feel if they told us how much to set aside for housing, for entertainment, <coughs> for food? We'd, we'd view it with contempt. We'd really say that that is totalitarianism. But we Americans accept that. Now, the ultimate end to this process that we're witnessing in our country is totalitarianism. Now, I am not saying that we are a totalitarian nation yet. But if you ask the question, which way are we headed, tiny steps at a time, are we headed towards more personal liberty or more government control over our lives? It'd have to unambiguously be the latter. More government control over our lives. Now, again, the ultimate end to this is totalitarianism. Now, we're not, we're not as I said, we're not totalitarian yet, but we're moving there step, tiny steps at a time. The great philosopher David Hume said, it is seldom that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. It's always lost bit by bit. And that's what we're losing, our liberty bit by bit. My late colleague, Leonard Reed, 
the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education, he explained it another way, and I like it this way. He said that if you wanted to take liberty away from Americans, you had to know how to cook a frog. <laughs> and he said that you cannot cook a frog by putting, a fr putting on a pot of boiling water and throwing the frog in the water. Because the frog's reflexes are so quick that as soon as his feet hit the boiling water, he'd hop away and be free. Leonard Reed said, the way to cook a frog is to put on a pot of cold water and put the frog in the water and heat it up bit by bit. And by the time the frog realized he was being cooked, it was too late. <laughs> That's the same thing with the American people. Anybody coming over here, take, coming over here taking all of our liberties, all at once, we would righteously rebel. But they can talk about taking away our liberties bit by bit as they're doing. Now the primary justification for the attack on private property, economic freedom, and privacy can be found in people's desire for the government to do good. We all say things like, well, government should care for the poor. Government should help failing businesses. Government should help the elderly. Government should help college students. Government should help other deserving segments of our society. But we have to recognize that government or Congress has no resources of its very own. That is all that what I mean by that is that all those programs coming out of Washington or your state capitol, it does not represent congressmen and senators reaching in their own pockets and sending out the money. <laughs> Moreover, there's no tooth fairy or Santa Claus giving them money. So when you recognize that government has no resources of its very own, that forces you to recognize that the only way the government can give one American citizen one dollar is to first, through intimidation, threats, and coercion, confiscate that dollar from some other American. Now, if you think I'm being too loose with the terms intimidation, threats, and coercion, well, you have until April 15th next year. Check me out. <laughs> you can tell the agents of Congress that you're very happy to pay the constitutionally mandated function of the federal government, but you are not going to have your earnings going to help foreigners, poor people, failing businesses, farmers. You will see all the intimidation, threats, and coercion that you want to see. And if you act it too tough, you get shot <laughs> by the agents of the United States government, by the Congress. In other words, we Americans, we support and we encourage government to do those immoral things that if a private person did the identical thing, we would roundly condemn, condemn him as an ordinary, despicable, low-down thief. Let me give you an example of this. Suppose I see an elderly lady sleeping on a grate in downtown Washington in the dead of winter. She's hungry, she needs medical attention, and she needs shelter. And suppose I walked up to Ron with a gun in my hand, and I said, Ron, give me your $200. And then with the $200, I go down, buy the lady some medical attention, some shelter and food. Would you find me guilty of a crime? Of course you'd find me guilty of crime. You'd find me guilty of theft. And what is theft? Theft is taking the rightful property of one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. Now, don't get me wrong. I think that helping one's fellow man in need is praiseworthy and laudable. I think that helping one's fellow man in need by reaching in your own pockets to do so is praiseworthy and laudable. Helping your fellow man by reaching in somebody else's pockets to do so is worthy of condemnation. 
And, and for the Christians among us, we have to keep in mind, when God gave Moses the commandment, thou shalt not steal, he didn't mean that thou shalt not steal unless you got a majority vote in the United States Constitution. <laughs> he meant thou shalt not steal. 